Our topic today is Kala plus Aka, different kind of Aka stuff, how it's, uh, it's uh, used in real world project and uh, to share the experience and uh, uh, yeah, some knowledge. So a uh, bit about myself, uh, I'm from Ukraine, that's a country nearby Europe. So my experience is 18 years from now, 12 years I spent on .NET stack, now I shifted for the last three years I'm uh, working for Redmat. Now I'm tech lead, work for fulfillment team, and it's JVM and Scala. And this is my point of interest, uh, this uh, kind of system design and uh, all of this stuff around. And of course, functional programming and, uh, and Scala as a semi-functional language. So uh, let's start. Uh, this is our agenda. Uh, uh, I will explain a, a little bit about uh, the system itself. So it's Redmat Capacity System. Uh, in particular, Fulfillment Center Capacity System. I will explain it later. We will immediately take a look at the end architecture. So to uh, bring the end design. And then uh, all, 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 all of this uh, downstream is the, I will explain piece by piece, all of the architecture. And uh, at the end, we will take a final look with uh, having in mind all of this explanation already. Again, this is a practical implementation. So of course, there is, like, there is a theory and there is a practical decisions which are sometimes not following exactly the theory. Yeah, because it's real world. Uh, so let's start. First of all, of course, is, uh, let's say, business need. So uh, uh, the, the goal is all of, all of the capacity system in Redmat. Uh, describe that, but let me first introduce what's actually uh, how it works from customer perspective. So Redmat is uh, online groceries. So we have app, we have website, you can order groceries. To do so, you first pick your uh, cart, you fill up your cart with the goods which will be delivered from the warehouse. Then you're supposed to uh, select the uh, delivery slot, which is two hours, when you want it to be uh, in front of your door. So to respond to this query and to show that, uh, actually uh, from customer uh, from customer side, via other services, we're not going to explain that, it goes to capacity service, and capacity service actually have to check whether fulfillment center can fulfill your order. So people in the warehouse can pick your goods, put to your totes, put, put them to the totes, then hand it over to transport system, and then transport system delivers it to you. So the purpose of the capacity system is to give the, uh, the response whether your order can be fulfilled from both transport and fulfillment center to be fulfilled and delivered at the uh, selected time slot to your door. So this is the idea of the uh, capacity, uh, the overall capacity uh, system. Uh, today we are going to consider a part of it, which is in red, which is fulfillment center capacity system. So it's actually physical warehouse where all the goods is there. And uh, it's a response to the request whether your order can be fulfilled from capacity from fulfillment center perspective. We are not touching the transport capacity. We are not touching the topic, how they matched together in the capacity service. It can be another talk. And we have one guy from the capacity team, maybe somewhere he will be like, next, week. next, <laughs> next time, yeah. <laughs> presenting all the right system. Yeah. <laughs> so today we focus on that. Uh, in short, uh, what's actually uh, this system uh, do is stated there. So actually, uh, it has one. Okay, this is simplified uh, amount of a request which is uh, it, it, which which it serves. It's more of them, but for the purpose of today talk, I cut uh, many 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 things which are not necessary to explain. So in general, in simplified version, we have two get requests to this service from the uh, different uh, other services, which is capacity availability from this service. 
It's get request, obviously. And uh, we have some management UI, which shows uh, what actually happens uh, uh, down there. So, uh, and we have uh, post request and delete request from same service. Whenever you make a reservation, actually, so you pick your time slot, this service responds, okay, this time slot available. Then you pick this time slot, okay, I want to be delivered here. So to this service, uh, post request goes, okay, we reserve this capacity uh, for you. So this is what post request reservation means. It actually makes the reservation. Then if you change your mind, or we have other circumstances when we want to cancel this reservation, we have delete request for this. Okay, delete this reservation. Free it up. Oops. That's fun. Yeah. That is fine. I will, I will update all the time. <laughs> okay, so, and we have uh, say, same kind of request from management UI. Uh, most uh, the heaviest one is capacity, and the second one is when we want to update its request for managers uh, when they actually set how much capacity do we have uh, available for our customers. So this is what management uh, things does. So uh, uh, a few requirements and observations. First thing, it's customer facing real time service, so no downtime allowed and uh, the response uh, must be very fast. Actually, this service is supposed to respond within 50 or 100 milliseconds, no more. Uh, next, observations. So uh, all the requests for available capacity, which is get, uh, it happens uh, several times more often than the reservation or reservation deletion. This is first observation. Second uh, observation is that uh, available capacity uh, get request and uh, get for management UI is pretty heavy in size and it takes time to build it, relative take time. So of course we are talking about hundreds of milliseconds but it's still it's, it affects. And uh, especially available capacity available for customer, it happens all the time. Whenever customers search for delivery slots, it's all the, they all the time bomb the service like to read this information. Uh, yeah, so this is like a high, very high level explanation for, of uh, requirements and business needs and what actually capacity stuff does. And in particular, what we are going to discuss today is the architecture of fulfillment center capacity uh, part, which is capacity service. Ah, of course, it's a microservice architecture, so all of this is microservices by definition. Everybody knows the definition of microservice, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, so as I, as I promised, we immediately take a first look to the whole architecture design. I understand that maybe many things is not clear. I will uh, uh, get through it very quick. So uh, we have, of course, in front of, in front of this service, we have load balancer. We have aggregate nodes. So, and we have query nodes. So it's uh, implementation for CQRS. And uh, load balancer immediately split the queries, uh, post and delete queries, which, are makes, uh, which makes modification. They uh, send it to these uh, aggregate nodes. They are in red. And uh, all the get requests goes to uh, query nodes, which are green. All of the nodes are tied together with ACCA cluster. So it's cluster. And uh, all the requests, HTTP, HTTP routine, all of this stuff is served by ACA HTTP. So you can see it everywhere. Uh, it's an event sourcing system. So the so-called common actor sends all the events, stores, and we use Cassandra as a backend for that. And they, they are replayed with ACA stream uh, to the query, query nodes. Also, whenever this, this guy shuts down or uh, these proxy guys, I will explain why this is a proxy and what this means that it's not a proxy, it's actual actor. I will explain it later. It's a cluster singleton. So whenever a crash happens and it needs to be uh, up again, so it reads the same events, replace the events and uh, become alive again. So this is very quick. 
Now we are going through each and every piece of that, and I will explain piece by piece. And then we will take a look at the same picture at the very end. Uh, so first thing, uh, let's forget, forget for a moment about the whole architecture and take a look at the actual uh, business class, which reflects the business logic. So uh, the, the class, we call it schedule, and I will use this term throughout the uh, presentation. So this is just a case class. It's not an actor or nothing like that. It's just a case class uh, which uh, keeps all of this structure as it stated, it's schedule. So uh, whenever we want to reserve, to make a reservation, it marks in this schedule uh, in certain point. I won't explain how it's organized, but it's three level structure, pretty complicated. It's uh, big enough. It keeps seven days in memory, uh, seven days of current, uh, avail uh, current available capacity to be booked uh, inside. So uh, this class is pretty big, relatively big. And uh, it's just a case class to keep all of the fields, or all of this data. And it's extended with um, traits, which the approach calls mixing, with all the behavior. So you can see many traits. Each of them implement uh, its own behavior. And uh, uh, there are key points here. So first of all, um, uh, this schedule, yeah, as I said, it represents the, 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 the whole schedule. It's one instance of the class. It does everything. Uh, operation modifiers, as I state here, is a pure functions. So by definition, meaning that each time you call it, it, will, it's, it has no side effect. It, it returns, and this is the second key point, a new instance of the whole schedule. So it's implemented in pure functional manner. So we are safe to, like when we want to make a reservation, let's say this is one of the methods from a schedule reservation trait. The schedule reservation trait has only one public method and other methods are uh, private, so uh, it's pretty clear. So when we do reserve, it returns a copy of the schedule, at least semantic copy. We don't know what's happened inside. We, there is some black magic maybe, but we don't know. Semantically, it's a copy. It's an important point for the for the rest. Again, delete reservation, it's also when it finds the reservation, it deletes it in the structure and it returns the copy of the, of the schedule. So this is uh, important points about the uh, uh, implementation of, of this class. Of course, the pros of that is that it's uh, covered with tests without any actors, without any, all of this burden uh, on top of it. We can just purely test uh, or, or let's say unit test uh, this class. We can easily extract it and put to other architecture. So everything is here. So this is, this is all about the business logic on this high level. Of course, it's lots of details, but we are not going to cover that. This is uh, key points. Next, uh, from, the, from the below, to from, the, from this uh, business logic class schedule, we are going a bit a bit higher, one level higher, is the actor which covers this as a state. So for, for just a reminder, what is actor model in general? And the uh, key thing is like uh, state is hidden inside the actor. Nobody has the act direct access to it, only actor itself. And only um, the, the messages which comes to actor uh, goes only via mailbox. So there is no concurrency, there is no race condition inside. So this is the uh, idea, gen general, very general idea of uh, actor model. Uh, in particular, ah, this is ACA actor. For those who doesn't know, very, very brief. So uh, whenever we want to create actor with an ACA actor, so we just extend actor which is provided by ACA. Uh, we have, let's say, state here. This is var, means, meaning that it can be changed. And uh, we have this receive method, uh, which receives uh, the messages, which can be any type. In this case, in this example, it's uh, strings. And uh, all the actors lives within actor systems. 
So actual system manage this actor. There are lots of things you can do with them, but this is just a very, very simple example. This is this instantiated of instantiation of uh, act, so called actor ref. So this, this guy is just a reference to which you can send the messages. This is an example how you can send the message. So I send this message in tell, using tell pattern, which is fire and forget. I, oops. I send it to the sector. So actually this function got called and this is what happened. I, I changed the state of the actor. Whenever as many, I can send this message as many times from uh, different places. It's guaranteed because of the mailbox uh, down there. It's guaranteed that there will be no race condition accessing to the state. So this receive method will be always called one by one. This is the key thing. Uh, this is another uh, pattern of calling it. It's called ask. So this guy returns uh, the future uh, and uh, you can get the response from the actor. This is the implementation of that. So we change state and we reply with something else, with anything else, uh, back to the, uh, to the caller in this case. So that's why, that's how we, so we, when this future completes, it returns the, it, it will return you this yo uh, swing. Uh, so, yeah, this is very brief about how ACA actors works. Of course, it's much more complicated, but it's just a brief introduction for those maybe who uh, don't work with it every day. Uh, what else? Yeah, one, one thing here is when you respond with something or when you send to the actor, uh, there is a, a serialization happens. So sometimes I will, I will get back to this later. So there is uh, not, not that straightforward if we are talking about distributed systems when, when actor res be, resides in some other place in the network. But yeah, uh, we'll tell about it later. So this is actually how schedule actor uh, is implemented in this case. So we have schedule as, a, as I described before, it's our business logic class, it's a state. We have this simple receive method. Of course, the production code is much more complicated, but it's uh, just an idea. So uh, we can send, let's say, reserve message. Then we modify the state. We can send delete reservation, uh, delete reservation method. We uh, call the delete reservation. And we, as I, as I said, the uh, schedule, whenever you, we call the method, any method, it returns its copy. So I just substitute the state with a new copy, which is created from that. So it's very, very simple. Again, key, key thing here is there is no race condition, as by definition provided by ACA actor, so it's direct implementation. So we are safe to do uh, this uh, change of state. No, no race condition. OK, moving on. More interesting thing, even sourcing. So uh, this, this slide is from almost from the documentation or from uh, uh, ACA persistence. Uh, ACA persistence is the, obviously the implementation for event sourcing. So whenever we want our actor to be a persistent actor, we just extend the provided persistent actor where we have to, stay, where we have to specify the persistence ID, which will be used on the... Uh, uh, underlying database state is the same uh, this, this 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 function is for convenience and uh, these two these two is the key to explain what, how persistent works so let's first take a look at receive command so it's actually the same receiver which receive events so uh, whenever we receive a command message so here we must clearly separate commands command messages, and events. So whenever we want to change state, it's obviously a command. For example, reserve. So when we receive that, first thing we do is, uh, in this case, in this example, we persist it. Then in case of successful persistent, we do 
we do update the state. Then we, uh, so we modify the state. Then we optionally can uh, write the snapshot. Snapshot is just a snapshot of our current state. It's just a full uh, um, serialization and save the current state. Uh, from even sourcing theory, snapshots is not there. It's just an optimization thing which comes from real life. So then let's assume a, a actor shuts down. Then it's up again. It reads the events, not the commands, but events, these guys. Uh, this function got called. It's out of the box from persistent actor. And it just replaces these events from the uh, underlying database, one by one, in the same sequence as it was stored in receive command. So you can see that it's the same update state called. And if snapshot happened, we just uh, assign the snapshot, which is deserialized from the database. We just uh, restore it to the uh, state. Typically, what happens. So when we modify our actor with commands, we store the events in the database. Then after 100 events, we store snapshot. Then we continue to write events. Then actor, let's say, shuts down. Then it gets up. So it goes to the, to the last snapshot, not the all events, but only the last snapshot, replace a, uh, some amount of events, not all of them from the beginning of the lifetime. It will be strange. OK, so this is a. Overview how ACA persistent works. Very, very high level. Uh, this is how it's roughly saying implementing in a particular case. There is one tricky thing here. So, again, it extends persistent actor, and uh, we receive reserve command. So, we want to make a reservation to the underlying uh, schedule, which represents our business logic. So what we can we actually do? Theory says the following. Uh, theory of even sourcing says the following. First step you do, you check, you validate your uh, command or event. You validate it first. Then you apply. Then you persist. Or when you persist and then you apply. So validation step is the key thing. Because if you, if you uh, persist the event, which you cannot apply, then during the, the reply, it will never get up again. You're this is, the, yeah, it will be recovering forever. It's crashed, try to, try to replay, crashed, try to replay, crashed, and in the in, in, in infinite. So this is a trick, how can we uh, tackle that? So first thing I do, I, under try monad, I call this uh, reserve. If it succeed, and I got a new schedule, so try success and failure is a standard thing. And uh, I got new schedule. At that point, I'm already sure that it will be applied. This is uh, like application and validation at the same time. Because from practical world, we know there is no validation that can guarantee us 100% of uh, application of that. Right? So here, I'm absolutely sure that it works. So then I produce the event. Uh, please take a note that we have reserve command. It's important. Uh, reserve command, but the event name is reserved. Because we further will replay uh, successful events. We are not replaying commands. Then I do persistence of this event. And this function is called then and only then the persistent successful. As soon as persistent successful, I change the state. I have everything here. I apply, so I validate. I validate the application. Then it succeed. Then I persist. As soon as persist succeed, I change the state. Everything, uh, everything clear. Uh, of course, in case of, in case of failure, nothing happens. Neither persistence nor uh, changing the state. So that's fine. So this is like normal flow. Then when our actor crashed or we just restarted normally, uh, receive recover. This is a function as I, 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 from the persistent actor. It's override. And this one, 
ah, this, this one is not override. This, this override, so uh, receive recover, replace the same events I uh, stored here. So what it does, it just applies the event knowing in advance that everything will be successful. I don't check anything here. Of course, this code looks like duplicates, right? So I applied it here, I applied it here, but this code is just for simplicity. The factual code is actually refactored properly. So it should be one function where we apply all of this stuff. So it's just for understanding. Uh, another special event happens here. So these guys, uh, it's your events and the recovery completed, provided by a persistent actor. It's for you to make something uh, as soon as recovery state completed. It's a separate state. The key thing here that uh, unless recover completed, no other messages will be delivered via normal flow. This is a, the key thing and uh, over one of the key things for persistent uh, ACA persistence. Because you, you know, right? So actor starts to getting up, normal events comes, and at the same moment it's recovering. So it, they are not, must not uh, interleave each other. Yeah, mailbox guarantees us no uh, race condition, but we have to recover first and then uh, up, uh, receive other events. So our persistence does that for us. No need to bother about that. A uh, couple of implementation details of event sourcing. So persistent storage we picked is Cassandra. It's uh, obviously Cassandra cluster. Uh, in our case, it's four nodes, if I'm not wrong. And uh, uh, serializer is another thing. So when we store the events uh, to, the, to the storage, uh, under the hood, the serializer is called. If there is no serializer provider, the uh, persistent calls Java serializer, which is like uh, heavy and uh, slow for a high performance system. So typically uh, a better serializer is taken. So we took Creo plus uh, Creo is a Java thing. So we need to pick something for Scala. I picked uh, Romix extension, but we were also considered a Twitter chill uh, as an extension. So, oh, sorry, why did it disappear? Yeah, so alternative serializer can be Creo plus Twitter chill, which is recommended now. Those days I picked Romix as it was the best. Or uh, if you consider that Google protobuf is also fine. It's also recommended, but I don't know how it works with Scala. I haven't tried. Uh, yeah, this is a, a, a few, few implementation like uh, details here. Moving on, one of the important point when we are talking about even sourcing in general, in this case in particular, is the versioning, is the pain point for even sourcing. So when you store your, uh, especially snapshots, which is a serialization of your huge state in this case, uh, and then you change something in there. So when it tries to replay it, obviously with a new version, the old versions will fail. So uh, there are a couple of uh, strategies uh, which, is, which are recommended to apply. In most cases, when you change the asset fields, like uh, it's uh, nicely implemented at Google Protobuf, you can extend your serializer where it can tackle it easily, relatively easily. But in this case, we went uh, simp the simplest approach. We just name everything we store. We name it as V1. It's also a valid approach, so it's the simplest one. So whenever we want uh, to change something, we have to create V2 and uh, provide uh, the adapter. This is a pattern for event sourcing when you provide the adapter to when you see the old uh, version then you, you, you now have a new version. So adapter must be applied from previous version to current one. Theory says that uh, your service must be infinite backward compatible with all of the events, uh, versions. Of course, it's bullshit in real world, so <laughs> <laughs> nobody does that. So the uh, thing, how can we cover that? And we did that, so using snapshots. Again, there is no snapshot in the official theory of that, but of course it's real world, so we have it. 
So obvious way is we uh, playing with snapshots. We can uh, like get rid of the old versions and have only two latest one. Uh, yeah, so this is what we use. Uh, next point, Aka HTTP. So let's remember that for, for a while. We get back to this later when we uh, grab everything together to the whole picture. Uh, now let's focus on another point, which is Aka HTTP. Oops. Uh, so as you can see in the picture, uh, all the incoming and outgoing requests and re uh, sorry HTTP requests and responses are served with Aka HTTP. So this is an interesting thing actually. Uh, Aka HTTP is uh, uh, you can implement with it all the interaction, all the HTTP stack interaction actually. Uh, it has pretty sophisticated and interesting and uh, DSL for that. The key thing, uh, though, uh, is based on ACA actor and ACA streams inside. So it's naturally, uh, nat natural, you can naturally use the, these, these two things. But key thing here is that it's not a framework. It's uh, something, let's say, a bit lower level, but still sophisticated enough and has enough power of its DSL and all of this stuff uh, to tackle this thing. So uh, it's, they stated this as here, as I copied from the documentation, and it's, I, I like it. It's general toolkit. So you can use it whenever you want. It doesn't restrict you with anything, but it's not that low level that you can, you, you, you are supposed to go down to uh, some very, very technical stuff. You can do that, but in general, you no, don't need. Uh, if you want to find a web framework, for example, uh, in opposed to that, like play framework, if you need it, then yes, you can take the play framework and uh, use play framework here. But for this project, it's definitely too much. We don't need this play framework with all of the unnecessary thing. I prefer to keep it as small as possible. So we use uh, this thing. This is the co code example how, how it works, actually. This, of course, it's much smaller than and an original one. So we define routes uh, with this the DSL. So in this case, we have path, which is reservation. Uh, it goes right after the domain name or IP address, right? So it's slash reservation. Then uh, we state that it's post. And what actually happens when here we state what actually happens when post request slash reservation comes. Post request. So this, this guy immediately deserializes the request. The payload is a post, right? So it's payload there. So it deserializes this uh, to capacity reservation type, which is DTO type for accepting the messages. And uh, uh, now you work with this deserialized object. This is case, case clause, actually. Uh, you can provide deserializer and deserializer. You want deserializer, deserializer. Because this guy definitely is JSON. So uh, it's deserialized to, from JSON to this one, and you, in con very convenient manner, you continue to work with the, uh, with the instantiated object. So here, what I'm doing, I create the message, which is command message reserve. I send it with uh, uh, ask pattern uh, to the schedule actor. I uh, request the result, and when it's completed, uh, when it's complete with success, I return the complete is from, um, from ACA HTTP as well. I complete it with created, which is 201 HTTP code, and uh, I provide the uh, response. Response is my case class again, and it's get automatically serialized to JSON and sent back to the caller. So this is how reservation implemented in uh, this uh, ACA HTTP manner. So next, so this is, this is routes. You can put them whenever you want in your code following your uh, rules. Then you, in the main service and at starting point, you actually bind uh, ACA HTTP, you bind it to, the, to your host, which you want to listen to, and you to the port. Uh, I, I should have put exact numbers here to be clear. It's actually constants from uh, app config file. So it's exact, 
exact uh, values, so no, 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 not a magic. And I, I put there the API roles variable. I just provided there, so that's it. And uh, this is future, so as soon as it's bind successfully, future return success, so I just log that, okay, it's binded successfully. From now on, it's listened to the port for the incoming request, that's it. So this is all about HTTP, it's as simple as that. It's uh, just a toolkit, uh, no need to use everything if you don't need anything else, like play, play framework or something else. Very lightweight, and the code is pretty clear. I like it. Uh, this slide is just where we are now, what we discussed where we are now. So this is the uh, <coughs> enlarged, uh, we have five boxes on the diagram, this is one of it which is enlarged. So we discussed ACK HTTP, it receives request, it converts the HTTP request to ACK, uh, to actor message as we saw in previous slide, right, message. Then we send it to command actor. Uh, command, uh, our schedule actor converts it to the call to underlying state, modify the state if needed. Then it returns with ask pattern, it returns the result here, it returns the result, and result got sent back via again HTTP as stated here, over there. It returns back to the caller. During the change state, as I explained before, uh, we persist the event, which corresponds to this uh, command message. We persisted to using ACA persistence to the uh, Cassandra cluster. If this, this is actor already. If the actor died or restarted normally, all the events will be replayed out of the box by uh, persistent actor, and the state will be recovered. And then no, normal processing will recover it. So this is where we are now. Uh, this box I showed here, this box is this one. A bit more details. Okay, moving on. ACA cluster. So cluster highlighted in green and uh, uh, tightened together all of those guys. Uh, I will explain it later, uh, but in, ACA, in, the, in each node of the ACA cluster, you can have role. I have two roles here. I will use it later. Uh, I have aggregate role, which I stated the name. Uh, we have a modifiable state here. And I have query, query role, which, is, which doesn't accept the uh, uh, modification commands. It's just for querying. So I will get back to this later. Just uh, just uh, remember that. So cluster, ACA cluster thing is an extension and uh, it's set up in uh, like that in the configuration file. Key thing here is the seed nodes. So whenever uh, actor system starts up, you use this construction which is extension on top of the system. It reads this configuration. So whenever a node starts, it reads this configuration and try to pin other seed nodes to join the cluster, to form the cluster. So that's it uh, for, uh, to set up the cluster. I'll explain a bit later what we are doing with cluster. So the, the, the thing we need from cluster, we need to know what is the size, uh, we need to aware of how many other nodes we have, uh, how many nodes of particular uh, role we have. Uh, I will I will explain it further. So uh, next is a special extension of cluster is singleton. So what's happening? What's actually happening? Uh, this singleton is a not generic solution. So cluster is can be used like more or less generic thing. So. Uh, this thing is used uh, particular for this business task. So uh, uh, a singleton extension is uh, the, it's about the, a group of node has only one instance, as stated in from the name as uh, singleton, it has only one physical instance of an actor. So a schedule is placed only, physically only, only one node. The 
other two nodes in this case, well, in this case we have three of them, uh, other two nodes are serving as a proxy to this one. And as soon as it's clustered, they know about each other. So this extension uh, automatically, so when the first node starts, it already knows that it will be, uh, it will, it will be the singleton actually. When second node starts, this one, it joins the cluster using seed node because this one is seed node. It joins the cluster, but it's already know that the previous one already started. So it uh, uh, knows that it's a proxy. So whenever call happens to this actor, call means command message. Whenever it happens, it just send this via wire. It send it to the factual actors actually, and this node as well. So this uh, singleton actually is um, like a recommendation to either not use it at all or to use for some configuration stuff or use it as rarely as possible. So it's not like a pattern or something recommended practice. It's for this particular uh, business case. So we cannot split this state. The reasoning for that is we cannot split this state any further. We must keep it together because this is this actor actually represented by a house, and we have a certain resources to serve uh, the to serve the uh, customer, and uh, we cannot split these resources to uh, split the actor uh, over the over the other nodes. It it must be together uh, as a, as a one instance. Uh, in this case, we use it purely for. Uh, failover. So whenever this guy crashed, uh, this recognizes that because it's in cluster. Uh, it's uh, in few seconds and knows that the uh, that somebody crashed. After after I don't remember two two seconds or something, it takes over uh, the responsibility and becomes the actual actor. This is the purpose of singleton. Again, we use it for failover to fast recovery and uh, to maintain the zero, almost close to zero downtime. When this actor goes down, not because of the crash, but in normal way, the uh, handing over the responsibility happens very fast. This couple of seconds delay happens only when this thing, this node crashed. Uh, we use AWS, and it's actually not a rally case uh, when it's crashed. So, I mean, not rally, it's a once per several months, for example. So it's a pretty valid case. We have two nodes here, uh, because I will explain it later, the split brain uh, problem. So, key takeaway from here, so for this purpose, for this task, we need a single actor, and this uh, we use singleton for failover, for quick recovery in this case, uh, in, in case of crash. Yeah. Actually, this is the code how uh, singleton set up. From, this is a bit messy, but from, uh, uh, from the service perspective, from the code perspective, when we set it up, uh, this, this guy, this service itself, it, it doesn't know whether this actor proxy or not after setting it up. So after cluster is up, uh, when from this HTTP, when the message is sent to the actor ref, uh, this link doesn't know whether it's proxy or not. It happens under the hood. Uh, by the way, this sending, yeah, it's a bit overhead for the traffic from traffic perspective. Yes. Question for my understanding. So, for all reservation operation, you use only one actor instance, instance. physical instance, only one. Okay. Uh, reservation and deletion, and all a few all others. Operation happen on one uh, single actor. Yes. Okay. So actually, this actor represents a warehouse. The direct response is warehouse. It can be split actually inside the warehouse. It can be split to chambers. We have few chambers. So it's actually possible to split even this. But it means that there will be uh, three or several sets of uh, singletons. 
per, 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 per chamber. But yeah, yeah, direct response, yes. We, at the moment, we have one physical actor to serve, in, uh, to serve reservation and reservation deletion. But does it mean that all concurrent requests get related to the same instance? And they queue up? Or? Yeah, they queue up because it's actor. This sending, it happens via actor model anyway. So when, when uh, a reservation request comes from here, here, and here at the same time, it's guaranteed that we, they will apply it here somehow one by one. We don't know the exact, uh, the exact sequence, of course, but it's guaranteed that there is no concurrency because it's still covered under actor. This is key thing here. Yes, it's it's a it's, it's a bottleneck, <laughs> but we cannot do anything with that. It is we cannot afford like uh, having them at, at the same time. But you said you split them by chambers. What does it mean by some department? Yes, inside the warehouse we have frozen, which is minus twenty, right? We have uh, fresh, which is minus five. We have tea or something, which is uh, normal temperature. We have other chambers, so. The warehouse, it's not a bottleneck, actually. There is not much load. I have sort of a better answer. So I've done load tests recently on these SOL systems. And basically, current implementation takes like five times our peak load. So it probably doesn't make sense to further complicate the setup since it's already covered well beyond what we need. Yeah. How, how many chambers do you have then? Five. Five? Or oh, six. So every time somebody puts some, something in his cart or he wants to make a schedule, you actually fire commands to to like one warehouse specifically. If, if yes. Yes. How many events do you have specifically on one warehouse? Because I can I can imagine that we're easily talking millions of events here, right? Mm, no. Yeah. I mean, for reservation. For reservation, no. There's sort of it's not it's, it's not like every time you pick one item into your cart. There is an event or a yeah, command sent here. Yeah, every time you want to actually, yeah, to ship, check out. So you use snapshots, I, I guess, right? Uh, no, when you make a check out, when you do check out, a reservation comes, right? Do, do you That's use, it. Do you use snapshots in the actor replay? Snapshots happens once, I'm not sure how it goes now, once per hundred, hundred something. Reservations. Uh, but you do use them. Yeah, of course. What happens when the persist uh, fails? Do you lose the event? Uh, persist, persist may fail during uh, next event, right? Or what do you mean by fail? So the event comes and you say that in the actor you first have to persist it before you update days. the state? Uh, yeah, I, I, I apply it but not change the state, so I have a copy. Then I persist. If persistent successful, then I take this copy and substitute the state. But if persist fails, then that means you lose the event. Does it, does it and that uh, yes. never happens. Yes, yeah. never happens. Yeah, you lose the event, it's crashed, everybody gets up in the night and... If there's a bug in persist, you will lose all your events. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we, have, we have backup policy for that. <laughs> And uh, this is a Cassandra cluster, so it provides uh, yeah, mo um, so right some features. Now, right now, as your consistency boundary, you use a warehouse? Uh, yeah, at the moment, yes, that's enough, more than enough. Why, why did you choose a warehouse versus an individual item? Like, is there a requirement that your warehouse is consistent? Uh, because warehouse it's warehouse capacity, yeah, right. So you have uh, a certain amount of people who can serve it. It's physical people. They can serve your order, your order, your order, your order. So that's why it's had to be concise. You cannot split in this in this level. Again, we can split it with the chambers, but we did this performance stuff. That we don't need it at the moment. Yeah, theoretically you can split it further, but then sort of making sure it's consistent within itself requires a lot of interactor yeah. communication. Current, yeah. And then it's like super complex. Currently, it's not needed. We will consider that we are actually uh, will probably expand soon. Problem. Yeah, but significantly expand uh, soon. Split by days. 
so you don't mm, have, need to no, no. no. We, we cannot we cannot yeah good question by the way we cannot even split it with days because the peaking happens overnight and it's uh, spread over over the over the night and uh, the so-called peaking peaking waves when people work they overlap so and overnight so, so everything tied together <laughs> No. I think we're so, so discussing red mark the yeah. model, not <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So. we can go further, but direct response no you cannot. Uh, one sorry, one question over there. So you you've got uh, the cluster. Let's say your your act, your singleton went down. Yes. So then it takes a few seconds to switch over to the other one, right? Depends on the situation. If it's crashed, yes. it takes two and a half seconds seconds. If it's normal shutdown during the update, it takes immediately. Yeah, because it sends the message, uh, I'm shutting down. So the next one, just take over immediately. If it's a crash, let's say it takes about two and a half seconds. Yes. What happens to the request in the meantime? Is that a downtime seen by the clients during those two and a half seconds? Uh, this uh, parent capacity service will retry to do that. It gets or the error. Keep yeah, it keeps retry. So retry mechanism, of course, implemented on a higher level. But in practice, requests that hit the node that crashes, they are lost because they are right. assigned to that yeah. node in the crash. Everything else is rerouted to other nodes, and then okay. they just you know, wait for a couple of seconds right. to, to get this. OK. And, and for messaging, obviously, you are using ACA everywhere. For messaging? For in within the service, yes. Between the service boundaries, it's just HTTP requests. Yeah. Yeah. So this one. Uh, key problem in uh, clustering thing is split brain problem. Split brain means that uh, within these clusters, we don't have any so kind super supervisor or some central thing which knows about everything. Everybody else, all the nodes. So. Uh, all the nodes, they know only about each other. This is the key problem. So there is no supervisor. This is the key, fi key thing of uh, distributed systems. So whenever, whenever uh, we lost connectivity, let's say network partitioning happened, and part of the pieces of the cluster doesn't see each other. So what, what the question is what uh, the rest of the nodes supposed to do. So if we are in these nodes, the only thing we see that we, we understand we, that we don't have other nodes. That's it. We don't know what happened. Whether they will get back or we lost them or whatever. Same happens here. So they, we do, we, from these nodes, we don't see these nodes. That's it. There is no supervisor. So there are uh, actually no magic here. There are a few uh, resolution strategies which can be applied. For those who are not aware of this problem or haven't read for a lot of time, uh, about that, so there is uh, this is a standard one. So static quorum, this first one. If we know the cluster size, then uh, we can actually uh, realize whether we uh, still in quorum. If we are so uh, going further, we implemented the static quorum actually because we know that we must have at least three nodes, at least sorry two nodes. So static quorum size is two nodes. So as soon as we appear it here, and there are still two of us, we are OK. As soon as we're in this part, and there is only one of us left, we shut down ourselves. Because we understand with, that we are not in quorum, and we must shut down ourselves and stop serving. So this is like what we took, because we know exactly that we have three nodes. Because one node and two is just a proxy. Split, split brain only, this is only a problem for a single tone part. For no, no, no. It's a standard uh, no, no, split like brain. For reading nodes, for nodes that serving get, get I will, you don't care. I will explain it later. So you do, you do care for split brain for, for reading nodes? Yeah, for read, read nodes, a split brain resolver works. So why do you need resolver in the first place for, for reading? Uh, read nodes? Yeah. I think they're not counted. Uh, no, read nodes uh, are also implemented that, but they based on... Uh, uh, the no, no, wh why the role it's role based. No, but why it's implemented for read nodes in the like at all? Because they must shut down themselves as soon as they are not in group with the uh, those nodes. 
why does it matter for it? No. Still reads. So but it's not uh, about uh, uh, split brain. It's about if event stream stops. But it's different problem. So like uh, split brain is not relevant. Uh. Yeah, it is relevant. Like on our like we have that implemented on our readways as well, uh, because our um, projections might be side effect. So say I mean say that you want to have singletons as well on your on your on your streets. So that say that you write to the database and you read these events. That's only one node that only does the same task. So you're not writing two times the same thing to mm -hmm. the database and overwriting stuff. Et cetera, et cetera. So you want only one to be present in your whole cluster that does one specific task. Is that do writing? Write. Yeah, it, it makes sense. Yeah, but do uh, get nodes. They yeah. don't do any writing. But like the the read side, the read side here is Akka streams, right? So yes. What that read side does is it actually tells your Cassandra database or whatever your event log, and then writes it to another database or does something no, else. No, no, it, it, it doesn't write anything. So can you go back? Yeah, I got you. I, I'm just yeah, thinking. So yeah, it the, looks the, like it doesn't no need. Writing, there are no state yeah, changes. Yeah, so Aka streams, no, it, Aka streams re reads from uh, from yeah. cluster, yeah. and applies the events to this one to recreate the state, yeah. to serve the reads. Yeah. Uh, so actually, what Grigory says is, why should we shut down these uh, queries as soon as it reads from the valid uh, Cassandra? So whenever somebody writes there, yeah, it's actually, maybe it's not needed. Don't know. I cannot imagine anything right now why we should. But anyway, it's implemented that it's shut down. Because it was easier to implement. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because it was easier to implement rather than not implement. I, yeah, I think not easy. It's safer, yeah. I would say. Because it's safer to shut down it. And it's safer. If, so I, I, if I don't see. Common sense say it doesn't matter for read nodes. And I want to validate that my common sense is a still sense. Uh, <laughs> I would prefer to keep the cluster concise anyway, even though, uh, even though, so if this part of cluster lost the main guys, yeah. I would prefer to be shut down. Yeah, but if you, if you're not shut down. The thing is, read it, you can't read it. The thing is, it's read, not. Read it not yeah, I agree with no, you. No, with, with if you can't write it, you still can read it. So if uh, the brain split, you cannot write, but you can show, uh, you can still serve current state. So basically, at least part of your uh, solution will be working. You can show like current state. Of capacity. here it's not shown, yeah. but the write nodes can also serve reads, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, but if you have pure read nodes, you don't have to shut down them, and then you st can still some capabilities of your. Solution. Okay, technical, technical, technically, maybe you're right. But semantically, I would prefer to Practically, keep it safe. If, if the request from the customer hits the read node that has completely obsolete data, will show something totally different to what's actual state. And then it will go to command handling and blah, 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 and it will eventually see that this state is not valid and rejected, but you know this is yeah. just basically putting more load on, on the system and having worse customer experience. It's a separate problem. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Let's okay. That's again to sum up. The technically maybe it's valid, but mm -hmm. right. <laughs> I technically, but uh, from, uh, from first of all from current implementation, it still gets shut down. This is, then this yeah. This is real world example. Yeah. <laughs> we care. We care about customer experience. Hence, yeah. we shut down read nodes that are. So, so they, they cannot read. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, so uh, actually now that read, read nodes, they shut down themselves based on the amount of uh, aggregate nodes anyway. And aggregate nodes does the same. Uh, okay. CQRS. So this picture is from Martin Fowler book and Martin Fowler site. site. Martin Fowler works for ThoughtWorks. Thanks, Kim. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, for, for those uh, like who don't remember exactly or something like that, uh, yeah, this is as clear as, as that. So typically we have a uh, model, not typically, but often we have model which serves both uh, read and write. So we have same model, we apply changes to it, we read from it, so on and so forth. It's no secures. 
When we want to consider CQRS, we split the models and we have common model, which serves all the uh, changes. And uh, then we have query model, which serves all the reads. Theoretically, query model and common model can be different. Moreover, common model can be uh, one. We have, can have one common model and lots of different query models, which uh, serves different purposes, which is reflected in this slide, uh, tightened to the event sourcing. So this is like typically in many applications uh, happens like that. So post, put, delete, all the modifications goes to the common side, then it stores, gets stored to the event store, then it's replayed theoretically or practically in many applications to the different uh, queries and then got queried from uh, other services. So again, CQRS is not a pattern, pattern uh, it's, a, it's an approach just to distinguish the commands and query. So we already touched it a bit uh, and uh, uh, in, in our implementation. So this is actually the code. It's a lot of code, but how actors actually implement it. Not the simplistic one from the beginning to uh, get you into the context, but this is close, much closer to re real, uh, real thing. So uh, it's, first of all, it's heavily used uh, traits. And uh, let's say we have this uh, schedule recoverable actor trait which re, um, extends only persistent actor. Then we have write-only actor, which, and read-only actor, both of them extends the same recoverable actor, meaning that both parts, uh, both are recoverable. And underneath they use the same uh, uh, schedule business logic class. So theory says that you're supposed to have, or you can have uh, different models serving uh, commons and queries. In this case, again, this is practical example, and uh, frankly saying, I didn't have much time to make this distinguishment, so I picked the same model, and uh, I use the same uh, for both types. Uh, this this piece of code is actually from uh, Akka Streams, so this uh, piece of code for read-only actor. Read-only actor are very small. It's everything you can see is here. So uh, when, when recovery completed uh, from underneath uh, recoverable actor, it actually constructs with its ACA stream code. It constructs the stream from our Cassandra read journal, uh, which replace these messages from Cassandra uh, to our schedule, to our instance. That's it. So after this code's executed, and it's executed after actor, read actor, recovery completed, so we have this model which is recovered, then the, we bind this to Cassandra, and all the events which comes from command node and stores to uh, Cassandra, it immediately replayed to the read nodes. Just replay. that's it. As simple as that, one way. Uh, and uh, this is like uh, uh, classes for command and query actor. They actually extends write-only and read-only actor and uh, had on, have only a few boilerplate things to start it up. And uh, um, uh, yeah, that's, that's actually it how it's actually implemented. <coughs> uh, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, schedule, oops. So, command actor and query actor, as simple as that. Uh, another thing for CQRS is routing on load balancer. So it's routes automatically uh, post and uh, get requests to appropriate nodes. Uh, it knows it advance which one serves what. Uh, next thing, uh, yeah, this is what I already said. So schedule class is used inside both actors, so in different manner, and uh, 
key thing here, the main purpose of that, as I stated in the very, very beginning, that the query request, which is capacity availability, and for management UI, but mostly for capacity availability for end customer. They are pretty heavy. They are query all of this big structure and uh, uh, form this big JSON and uh, send it back. Uh, so we need to scale out actually uh, the query part. This is the key thing for this particular task. So that's why this separation happened and we can, actually there are a few nodes only, but it can be in infinitely scale, scale out and serve uh, these heavy requests. Uh, yeah, that's, that's almost it for CQRS. I wanted to point one thing. Yeah, there is one thing. I don't know why I'm supposed to have a slide for that. It's an interesting thing, but somewhere it's lost. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, there is one thing in actors and that's just DSL. So when, uh, whenever we want to mix in different traits, which are actors actually. This uh, uh, receive command thing, it can be uh, mixed together. So when you, when you uh, code that and you, you say you have trait uh, with one actor, you have another trait which is another actor, extends actor. Both of them can receive uh, certain commands or certain messages. When you mix them together into concrete class, like here, right? So uh, you can uh, mix these receives together with one line of code. And this result uh, mixing, the resul result uh, function will accept both uh, messages from both actors. So this is one trick which is applied here, but unfortunately, uh, I haven't included the the code here. Very simple, but it's possible. Just 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 to share that. Uh, last thing, almost last thing, uh, is again from real world how to update that. So there are few strategies for when you want to update all of those. Uh, we picked so-called uh, rolling update. Uh, the difference from normal uh, rolling update means that you update one by one. As soon as new one gets up, you uh, one node gets up. So I stated in the picture. So yeah, let's have you have three nodes in this example. You update one. As we stated, this this node backward compatible with the previous one, so it can serve. You see that okay, it works. Then you update the next one. Okay, it works. Then you update the last one. So the, the, the only uh, modification here is that uh, we update query node first, then we update singleton proxies, and only at the very last, as the very last step, we update singleton instance. Uh, this minimize, so we update green, then we update proxy, and then we update this one. Why? Because when we shut down this one in normal manner, it sends the message, okay, I'm shutting down, please take over. So this guy, takes over its responsibility. And it's already version two. So we minimize the downtime of that. Uh, yeah, so this is like uh, uh, about the how to update that. Another slide I accidentally deleted right before is the slide about uh, testing that. So during each time we build this, uh, we use Travis, so it's um, built on these uh, virtual machines. Uh, to test that and test in particular, let's say, this split brain resolver for both cases, let's say, not the crash and normal shutdown. So I implemented this as a, and within the same virtual machine, I implemented this as a three virtual, three GVMs or, or five GVMs starts up. Each of them is actually an instance, but within one machine. So it's GVM, uh, different GVMs on one machine. And then, uh, I like try to crash one, see what happens and check uh, how it works. And then or oh, normal shutdown, in code it looks like kill or kill minus nine. So test, it, test everything how it's supposed to be on the real 
real uh, environment. Of course, it's not the real one. It's Docker maybe could be better, but we don't use Docker at the moment, so GVMs is as close as possible. Uh, it's about integration testing and testing of the split brain and some other cases uh, which are close to real world. Uh, yeah. So, final look. As I promised, we covered each and every point here. And uh, just a final look at it. So, down below is a list of technologies which we use here. And uh, the, like, key, uh, key outcome from that is, okay, it works. Uh, we tested it on a higher load when we have, much higher, and uh, it survives. Uh, so you can relatively safely use it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, that's it. Questions? Yeah. Uh, uh, for the spring rain, split rain resolver, the, are you using the light band's uh, commercial uh, resolver? Or uh, no, I implemented it myself. I took it some from somewhere from the GitHub's GitHub who implemented somebody else. I, I actually tried to ping Lightband, but they didn't reply. <laughs> and uh, I had no time. So I took it from the internet and there was an error box there. So I, I changed it and make it, made it work, put it to the tests and it works. So. Yeah, yeah, they have paid version, you're right. And you can configure, you can just put it to the configuration and uh, put it to SBT and configuration, that's it, it will work. Yeah, I know about that. I read I could could uh, do that, but I, I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't reach them. Okay, the other and the, the implementation is simple, actually. The other question is the uh, car streams part that uh, publishes the events to the, the read instance, right? No, just the diagram. The in a diagram, uh, do you have a, like a, a multiple instance for the publishing part? Because it's just a line there, but the uh, car stream, I suppose, is something running in some nodes. Uh, it's just bind to, Aka to Cassandra cluster and pull in the events, periodically calling the, call the Cassandra uh, whether they have cha changes. So That's it's it. Periodic poll. Yeah, it's periodic poll. And uh, the streams runs on. Our stream write uh, runs on these nodes. Oh, runs on the yes. Node. Yeah. And it's uh, it, this this guy, this thing provided out of the box. We didn't write it. Uh, the the this uh, this this thing as uh, we didn't write it. So. I don't know who Aka provided. It. It's a plugin. Yeah, this one. Yeah, it's like a persistent part. Correct. Uh, Aka Persistent provides a few things out of the box to, to make that. Well, if I'm not wrong, it's provided from Mongo, for Cassandra, or for something else. Postgres. Postgres, right. Thank you. Yeah, so I just pick it from, from there, and uh, I wrote this piece of code. It's on the node, and uh, it starts up the uh, stream, and whenever, and it, <coughs> it, it does pull, pull in. I read it deliberately before the presentation to ask the question, how does it fetch it from the Cassandra? <laughs> yes. Uh, how was your experience while working for this project outside Aka? Means uh, for other scalar libraries like HTTP encoder decoder, calling Cassandra DB queries. So oh. For those libraries, how was your experience? Documentation is missing. For what? Total books are there. The documentation is amazing. For Aka, Aka stuff, all of the Aka stuff, Aka HTTP, Aka actors, uh, singletons is a bit, bit tricky, yeah. But everything else inside Aka is fine. And outside Aka for other Scala ecosystems. Scala. So HTTP JSON support is Spray, which is basically former Aka HTTP, whatever JSON. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Cassandra, it's a plugin by Aka Persistence, so there are no direct queries to Cassandra. And that provides your uh, function DB queries. There are no, there are no database communication in this service, like at all. Everything, oh, okay, okay. nothing. Just, just for yeah, yeah, yeah. The only thing we, uh, the only thing is uh, was was implemented is the serializers. 
So serializers is Creo, but I need it's a pain. It's a pain. <laughs> so I needed to tweak it a bit. Because okay. sequences at the root cause of that is type erasure, which is the pain point of the whole Java world. So I, I came from uh, .NET world. So .NET is here, GVM in this case is here. So it's, I face it all the time. So I, need to, I needed to tweak it because it, does, it erases the type. So this was the tricky part of this. Initially, I, another problem was handed over uh, during the normal shutdown. The handing over from here to here, this also was a problem when I started to, but recently uh, was fixed. By the way, the same serializer is used to pass the messages from this proxy via this arrow to here. It's the same serializer which stores messages to Cassandra. So intercluster communication is also used the same uh, serializer. So the, this is a tricky thing, then you have to be careful and pick the serializer carefully and correctly to be as fast as possible if you have heavy loaded system. I saw you versioning the, the, the event serializers. Like, do you, do you version the commands as well? Yes. Commands? I don't need to version commands. You, you, you serialize them, right? Commands, no. I serialize events. You, you know, e comment come, right? Yeah. I, I, I translate it to event and I store event. So I serialize only events. So the command serializes events and you replay events and therefore events uh, need to be versioned. But, like but commands have... is like intermediary, it's not like an I got your question. Yeah. I, I got your question. Yes, you're right. You're right. Then I it means that I have versions for commands as well. You're right. Because otherwise it will fail. Uh, between load balancer and ICA streams it seems cluster is here is just like for fun. I mean, like, seriously, you can implement all this, like, like you can remove a, a cluster and it will work. So How? Only things that, uh, like, it's quite easy. So you, you, cannot, you cannot build singleton on top of <laughs> no cluster. I can. Singleton works on cluster, if I'm not wrong. So, but you get the uh, easy recovery thanks to uh, the cluster. We want the cluster, mm -hmm. the fact that we can easily come back, you have to implement it for some, which could be uh, more painful. What? the fact that um, I feel like because you use Kafka, you can then this uh, proportion down event and recover properly. You mm -hmm. could implement it yourself. You want Kafka, but I feel that's more work. Basically, you mean like to maintain uh, amount of nodes served? So just like it's oh, just the fact that it takes over. Is that building? Okay. Or 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 is building mm -hmm. Kafka. So you don't need just but basically, maintain no number of nodes. So the only reason like to have to have cluster here is you want to maintain certain number of nodes. Yes. In this case. So the one serves it, right? Yeah. The, yeah, this this amount so when it's cluster these nodes knows about each other and then it knows that I'm a proxy in this cluster. No, like, uh, you already have a uh, Cassandra cluster with uh, event stream, so to implement singleton you don't need cluster like it's redundant. It's enough to have uh, uh, event stream to implement a uh, single don in your case. There's application states, which is that schedule like, thing. How yeah, will you, so how will if you? It's, if it's present on two different nodes, if yeah. they're not clustered, well, if, they are, if it's present on two different nodes, you have a chance of race conditions between the no, two. No, no, you have an uh, event stream. You cannot, if it's one event stream, you cannot have race So conditions. the business concern was that we shouldn't, if we just have one unit of capacity left and we have two concurrent requests that try to book that, only one must win. Like if we if were two, yes. this is a, you know, But if you have an uh, event stream, which will align them like one by one. No, because if you have two actors with two different states, they can persist the same event at the same time. No, they cannot, this, uh, this can be easily uh, overcome if you identify each right event with uh, like with, like node, like when it starts, uh, generate then the GUI. Then optimistic concurrency, right? And then you're basically manually rolling up your own implementation yes. of single but single writer. No, basically if you if you wasn't like last node to write, then you're not allowed to write. So for example, you can write like a fake uh, elect event with an node ID, 
and therefore actual rights only allowed uh, for elected uh, nodes. So if last event you received uh, it uh, doesn't have your mark, then you're not allowed to write. And this and is basically your own implementation of a cluster system. But in this case, you, like adding to the uh, event, just node uh, ID replaced like entire like functionality of cluster here. How does it help preventing access to single? Okay, guys, state? you can you can you can talk about <laughs> it. We can find uh, lots of implementation for this task up to the business task so yeah, this is we can discussion, the most yeah. important thing in this yeah. okay then let's let, let's draw then <laughs> let's let's come and draw yeah. all of them yeah they so uh, any qu other questions yeah I've got one here um, so you kind of moved over from the dot network into this uh, into the java world is there any reason particular reason why i mean for fun I moved from Ukraine, which is roughly 8,726 kilometers, <laughs> roughly, uh, to here. It's also for fun. <laughs> I, I guess, I, I guess the, the thought in my mind was that you could have stayed in .NET and played with that shop, which would have been similar. I'm, con I'm considering to moving back to, to .NET. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I have 12 years experience in .NET and uh, zero experience in Java. So I just wanted to expand my knowledge. So fun means expanding my knowledge. So I downgraded a bit. I used to be project lead and even uh, director of engineering or something like that. Then I downgraded to the senior software engineer just to investigate the, how this GVM works. Especially, of course, Scala. So I don't know pretty much Java. I don't like it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so this functionality. Bef right before that, I had the chance to implement a small project on F-sharp. Yeah, it's better. And, .NET organized, organized better. So I would put like the, these languages, right? So Java is the lowest one. So let's split it in the middle. GVM is right, .NET is on the left. So Java is on bottom, then C sharp, right? Then Scala, then F sharp. And here is Haskell. <laughs> <laughs> so I would put it like that. Yeah, but uh, the response to your question, I just want to explore this word. Without practical hands-on, it's impossible. I can read a lot, but it's impossible. Now I know. <laughs> and I don't like Scala at all. <laughs> it's the best choice we have now. In GVM. In, in GV, on GVM, yeah. But I don't like it. Those guys in, from, from Bangalore created something like E-Tower. I don't, know, I don't remember what was that. That's basically a Haskell port on GVM. Oh, <laughs> no, no I haven't read it. It's, it's not ready yet. Sorry, what? Over no, there. no, no, not a, not a sort of a new something thing. It's like a, a husband and wife team. I, I haven't heard about that. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's wait. Uh, I, I, I'm waiting actually for Scala 3 or Dirty. whatever they call it. Dirty. yeah. This is like something I expect and let's see. So I, I give it a hope. Uh, other questions? Hopefully it's not like Python 3. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Yeah, could you go back to the slide where you introduced factors and relations? You say that factor is lightweight and at the same time it has a thread. Is it correct? Is it like one to one mapping? This one? Yeah. Uh, it's not, a, this is not exactly correct. It's the best picture I've found. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, it's not. Second item on the list. Yeah, yeah, I, I got your point. This one. No, 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 no. No, this, this is actually a bit ugly. So I didn't stop at this slide uh, for too long to not give you a chance to read it carefully. But you unfortunately read it. So yeah, this not mean, it doesn't mean that it's physically a separated thread there. It's an actor system. It has its schedule inside. And it's assigned the threads within this uh, uh, algorithm. Uh, to, pr to process these uh, messages and to assign in threads to one actor or another. So it's not, it doesn't mean that it always keep a thread on it. No, no way. So I think the statement here is like uh, actor system use threads to be non-blocking. Yeah, non-blocking. Uh, yeah, yeah. Was there more, more than one thread? More precise, that's correct. More precise is it's non-blocking. Yeah. It's not the thread, it's not blocking. Yes. Mm -hmm. And another one with uh, question marks. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is this synchronous operation or asynchronous? 
uh, this uh, this one, the last one, uh, is asynchronous because the return in thing is future. So it will become synchronous as soon as you put something like await dot result and put this future in there. Then it will blocked. So you mean yield control and release yeah. the thread, right? Yes. And anyway. Whole yeah. Exactly. You can write as a next step. You can write response future uh, complete. Then let's say I don't know success or whatever, and uh, then like log, I completed. It will be executing on uh, asynchronous manner whenever future completed, but it's not blocking. This one is not stopped here. Hi, I got your question. This guy is not doesn't stop here. No, uh, no, no. As well. huh? those, those yeah, those both of them are not are not locking. Both of them. And what about the receiver creation? If I need to make a call to another actor, is it also asynchronous? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, here is this sender is a special thing. So I send. I send this back to the sender, but actually, uh, inside the actor, inside the actor, you have so-called context, mm -hmm. and uh, you can write something like context get actor by name, and get the actor ref from for the other actor somewhere you don't know where is that, mm -hmm. and then you send in the same manner you send message to this actor. Okay. Something it's also non-blocking, and even if you call like that. It will return your future, but it's not blocking anyway. And th therefore, you can send a message there. But you must be careful here. There are some patterns. There are some approaches to not make it like spaghetti calls everywhere. So, And uh, actors actually is also must be used very careful. Because uh, sometimes some projects tend to use actor too heavily. Actor is a simple thing. The best case of usage is like uh, having a state per actor. That's it. To wrap one state. Many, many, many projects fail to use actor as a function. Actor is not a function. It's something which covers some state. But actor is uh, dynamically typed, right? I can send like yes. any type to any actor. Yes, yes. You can send so anything. Unfortunately, uh, you don't have control over it. There's sort of exper experimental extension to actors that yeah. types actors, but it's so experimental that it doesn't work. Yeah, but you can practically uh, in a fair actors called mailbox and they type. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, this is the pain. The, this is the pain point. So I can send to my actor, which receives only uh, reserved or reserved for something. I can send this sheet as well. So typically the end of the receive is like that. K is underscore login for receive that known message. Or log error or something like that. You need to reply to the originator with some increment. No, you don't have to. If it's a tell, you don't have to. Don't have, don't have. to reply. reply to don't have. Like, like, uh, known message. Yeah. Uh, if, if you want typing, I guess you have other choices like future, morning. Actually, what will happen if you do my actor ask and send a message that can be handled by actor? Then you wild uh, wildcard case. We'll this one? Yeah, but it will never say reply to sender. So there's, there's this future will like never complete. Yeah, will never complete. Most probably, yes. Yeah. Hadi, yes. So for the split brain problem, does the recovery only work if the partition is in two parts? And if it's in three or more parts, then there is no recovery? Why does it matter? Because there's a quorum, like minimum two. Uh, yeah, so how it works actually. Split rate resolver works uh, like, like that. Uh, there are three of us. One, two, three. So we see together. We see each other. Then something happens. Oops, I don't see anybody. What should I do? How many of me, of us? Of us? Oh, I'm only one. Quorum is two. Okay. That's it. If they are also split. If they, if they also split, they so both the kill themselves. <laughs> yeah. so All the cluster dies. If they're no network, so yeah. split brain is a network connectivity issue, yeah. and if there's no network connectivity, there's no cluster anymore. So it only kind of protects from yeah. partitioning into two parts. No, it only protects if you if a part of your cluster is out of network. Yeah. If a small part, yeah. No, it's yeah, regardless. If, if you have a huge yeah cluster like 90 nodes and then you have split them into three then it's 
you know, yeah, still I mean, would work. Example, well, you have only the yeah, in this particular case, the, there are three aggregate nodes. So as soon as some part, including query nodes, as soon as it sees that aggregate node is only one, so let's say we have one aggregate and two query, they will shut down themselves, all three. That's it. That's as simple as that. But it's this particular task. There are other strategies how can we uh, implement that. But we must decide and think carefully about that. Because uh, uh, split brain problem is one of the pain points. It's any cluster. Because uh, if they start to serve events, both of them, and start to write down to event source from both parts, they mix together, and you will sit, you will spend the whole night, next night of your life, trying to figure it out how to fix that. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, last announcement I must do. Red Mat is hiring. Uh, please, if somebody interested, please follow the link. Also, we have these uh, pens and uh, all of this stuff from Redmat. You can take it for free. It's a present. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.